Splendid. Thank you for that. And thank you for your lovely welcome. It's great to be here. Uh, I consider it a real privilege to come and uh, hang out with you guys. I've never been to a United Reformed Church General Assembly, and I've never had one of these on my platform either. And I don't know, but I suspect this could give me an inappropriate power to make a decision and bang it and something will happen, which would be really, really uh, exciting. Uh, I really appreciate the invitation. It's a, it's a privilege to come and uh, share with you and to take some time to look at uh, the Acts of the Apostles together. We're not going to look at the whole book. Uh, we're just going to pick some passages over the next four days and explore together some of the things uh, that are foundational to our lives as Christians and uh, as a church. And uh, I pray that we will discover in some of these passages the things that unite us, the things that pull us together as uh, Christian people as we seek uh, to follow Christ and to pursue God's mission uh, in the world. As uh, Val mentioned, my own passion is uh, mission in Europe, uh, and I work uh, with an organization called the Blessed Network, uh, which is uh, enabling uh, young people to engage in mission. We have projects in France and Croatia, uh, some links in Spain, a little bit in the Netherlands, and we're just seeking uh, to get young people engaged in mission in this uh, European uh, context. It's a really, really difficult time to be church, isn't it? You guys... Val and Kirsty, um, I hope they told you what a tough thing you're taking on. Uh, this is a really tough time to think through what it means to be church, but it is also a brilliant time to be alive and a brilliant time to be wrestling with God's Word uh, for our contemporary culture. It's a great time to be engaged with God in what He wants to do. And as I hope we'll see over the next four days looking at uh, the Acts of the Apostles, God is continually planting and replanting and renewing His church, and we get the privilege of being uh, part of, of that. Let's take a look at Acts uh, chapter 1, as was read to us. These are the words that are kind of foundational to our whole understanding of what it means to be church. In the words of uh, Brian McLaren, this is the story we find ourselves in. This is the story that shapes us. This is where it all begins. I want to go back, not to try and recreate it. Some of you will uh, remember the 1970s. Uh, they tell me that if you were enjoying yourself in the 1970s, you don't remember any of it, but I'm sure some of you remember the 1970s. And I had some really good friends in the 70s who were involved in sort of planting a whole bunch of new kinds of churches, and they loved to call themselves the Restoration Movement because they were restoring the New Testament church. And they did some brilliant stuff, frankly, and they, they, they broke through into some new things that were a blessing to the rest of the body of Christ, and it was great. But at the heart of it, there was this really strange idea that we could recreate the Acts of the Apostles now. So we would try and do everything. They would try and do everything to sort of match the book of Acts. That's not what I'm asking you to do over the next few days. I'm not saying let's go back to the book of Acts, recreate it, pretend it's now, and just try and live this way. What I am saying is let's go back to the source code of what it means to be church. Let's go back to the source, the DNA of mission. And by going back to the source, to the beginning, to the sense of what started all this, maybe reconnect with what it will mean to be missional church in the 21st uh, century. Let's go back and look at the beginnings in order to get a sense of what the story is that uh, shapes us. Uh, Acts, uh, the book of the Acts has a great uh, structure to it. Uh, as we, We've already had a lovely linked reading from Luke, which is fabulous. Uh, Jesus tells his uh, disciples before his death that there's going to be a promise from God that they should wait for. Then after his death and resurrection, he gathers them and he launches them into this thing called church. And the book of, in the book of Acts, Luke continues to explore the works of Jesus, but now through the church. And the brilliant thing about the book of Acts is it has no ending. When you get to Acts 28, which is officially the end of the book... You get this wonderful thing where Paul uh, is speaking to the Jews in, uh, in Rome at that point. He's holding a bunch of Bible studies, and he says to them, uh, I've explained some stuff to you. Lots of you haven't received it. And he says this, so now I want you to know that this salvation from God has also been offered to the Gentiles. That's everybody, the rest of the world, and they will accept it. So the implication is that Acts 29 is the ongoing exploration of that, and we are still part of the Acts 29 church. We're still in this thing, that what started in those 28 chapters and then was launched into the Gentile world is what we are still part of. It's still going on. This code, this source code, is still meaningful to us. It's still the code that we belong to. This is the map we live by. This is the, 
This is the, the ground we're walking on. This is when, where, where God comes and says, this is who you are, this is where you are, and here are the things I want you to do. So let's just look at these words of Jesus. Uh, sorry. Uh, oh, what were they gone? Something strange happened there. I'm very sorry. Okay, I'll just keep going on here. It was probably my fault. I think I clicked twice. No, one of my slides disappeared. I'm sorry. It was just, uh, it's a, I lost my, my, uh, my picture of a cow. Never mind. Um, let's just, <laughs> I had a lovely picture of a cow to show you. Now you're all going to be sitting here for the whole of the rest of the, never mind any business. You'll be sitting for the rest of the four days going, what was the picture of the cow? I'll see if I can find him. We'll put him back in late, later. Let's just go back to those words of Jesus. When the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, are you going to free Israel now and restore our kingdom? The Father sets those dates, he replied. This is the New Living Translation. And they are not for you to know. But when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will receive power and will tell people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And Luke is like a really good novelist. He's a John Grisham. He wants to set up the whole of the adventure of Acts in this one conversation. In this one conversation, the whole unfolding adventure is set up. And in essence, here's what Jesus is saying to his disciples. And I believe passionately that we can go back to this as the core, the code, the source of what it means to be God's missional people in the world. He's essentially saying three things. Trust the Father, receive the Spirit, and tell the story of the Son. Trust the Father, receive the Spirit, and tell the story of the Son. And the rest of the book of Acts is Luke showing us how that happened with these different communities, how it was explored, how it went on, how it was that these groups of early believers trusted God and received the Spirit and told the story of Jesus. And of course, the challenge is how do we go on doing that? And the challenge for us now, 21st century people in a, in a world that is is very confusing, particularly uh, recently for us in the West as we face the most colossal questioning of the economic basis of our culture, as we face a questioning that is leading so many people to think really deeply about how we live. The challenge now is can we come back to that simple formula of trusting God our Father, of receiving His Spirit, of telling the story of Jesus, and recreate communities that will bring hope and life to our world. I pray that that is what we are engaged in doing. Right here at the basis of Acts is this Trinitarian formulation of how the church should operate. Trust the Father, Jesus says. They say, when are you going to do all the political? We want to get rid of the Romans. We want to have a Jewish kingdom. We want you to be our king in Jerusalem. They've got all these mixed up ideas about what was supposed to happen. And Jesus says, it's not for you to know when all these things are going to happen. It's not for you to know, but the Father is in charge of those things. Trust Him. Trust God that He is doing what He will do. Trust God that He is building His church. Trust God that He has passion for the things that are going to happen in the next two years of the life of the United Reformed Church. Trust God that He wants to bring healing and blessing to your communities. My friend uh, Jeff Fanton, who's uh, just stepped down, he was the European director of uh, YWAM, Youth of the Mission, for 20 years. He has this brilliant phrase. I absolutely love it. It's so simple, but it really challenges me, and it's this. It is always the will of God for the will of God to be done. It is always the will of God for the will of God to be done. It is always the will of God. And God has desires, longings for your community where you gather as a church. God has desires for your cities, for our cultures. God is, God is doing things in our world. The Father is at work. Trust Him, Jesus says. The picture you're part of is much bigger than you yourself know. I don't know if you can uh, see my little uh, record here. I just love this uh, photograph I found of uh, um, the old Beach Boys. Do you remember 45 RPM? Yeah, no, not at all. Some of these people out here do, but none of you remember 40 iPhone. No, no. 78 maybe, but 45, no. I'm sorry. Uh, this is the Beach Boys classic, God only knows. And that's what Jesus says. Trust God that there are things that God knows that you're not supposed to know because you're supposed to walk in trust. Trust God the Father that he is at work. It's all about a life of trust. The God who has been at work from the beginning will continue his work through to the end. And then Jesus says, 
receive the Spirit. Wait for the gift that is coming. You shall receive power when the Spirit comes upon you. Because the coming of the Spirit is so important to Jesus, because it's the moment that has been waited for, that has been prophesied for generation. It's the moment that people of God have been lined up for, that God has been wanting to pour out His Spirit on human beings. Intimacy between humanity and God that was not possible before the the death of Jesus, that God would come and breathe His life into humanity. And we don't have time to do it now, but when you look at the the way uh, Acts chapter 2 is presented and the coming of the Spirit of uh, Pentecost, it is full of creational language. It's full of the language of the God who breathed life into Adam, the God, the wind that blew over the surface of creation. And there is this wind that comes and breathes new life into God's people. Why? because the coming of the Spirit is a new step forward in what it means to be human. The coming of the Spirit is not just a little bit of a party for the church. It's not just an added extra on the gospel. It's not just something for religious people. The coming of the Spirit is a breakthrough in the human story. It's the possibility of the Creator God to dwell in the hearts of people. I was very challenged by this, particularly by a chap called Max Turner, who's been teaching for many years now at uh, uh, London. In fact, he's been uh, sick recently, but he's been teaching at London School of Theology and traces through the Old Testament the promises of Pentecost. And I was challenged with this question, what if Pentecost is the moment Jesus died for? Pentecost is the delivery of what Jesus paid for when it is possible for the Spirit of God to come and for individual people to be in communion with Him. That's why the early church was so focused on receiving the Spirit, because the coming of the Spirit is when a human being created in the image of God is reconnected with God their Creator, and intimacy is possible again, and human flesh can carry once more the Spirit of God. Trust the Father and receive the Spirit. Let the Spirit come and fill you. Fill your communities. Fill your art. I don't mean, folks, I, hope, I, I, I never, don't know who I'm talking to because I've never met you people. You're absolutely lovely, so I don't know where you sit on all this, but please, just let me, let me just say what I feel. I don't mean the Holy Spirit can come so we can all have nice meetings. God did not send His Holy Spirit so that we could write some worship songs. Yes, that's part of it, But the purpose of Pentecost was not for you to have a better worship team. The purpose of Pentecost is that the whole of human life, in our art and in our families and in our relationships and in our politics and in the way we are as a culture, the whole of our lives should be invaded and infused by the spirit of the sovereign God. That the character of God would shine through all that we do coming of the Holy Spirit is an amazing opportunity for human beings to live the life they were created to live. God says, receive the Spirit, be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Let the Spirit come and transform your lives into celebration. The Spirit coming is a movement forward in the history of the human story. And then Jesus does something in this little passage which is really 